morning and thank you for joining me. And before I hop into the word this morning, just a reminder that our um, pastor's two ministries, Dan Chapman, accepted a position as um, a chaplain for hospice. And so next Sunday will be his last Sunday with us. And um, we invite you to join us after the service for a time of food and fellowship. Uh, we'll try tip lunch and express our appreciation to Dan and his family for all they've done. And so um, before we kind of get into God's word this morning, the other thing is um, kind of believe it, you know, in terms of preaching, I want to give credit where credit's due. And so I just want to mention David Platt kind of uh, was listening to a message by him and it served a little bit as the inspiration for um, some of the things I'm sharing just at the beginning of the message. And so, like I said, I just always want to give credit where credit's due. But um, so I want you to put on your kind of imagination caps for a moment and pretend for a second that you you go to your workplace or you go to your school or maybe the grocery store or Starbucks or maybe the Embarcadero on a weekend in the summer where there's lots of people and you begin to tell everybody that's within earshot of you, begin to tell them that they need to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if they don't accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they'll spend the rest of eternity apart from God in complete isolation. And, and so I want you to think about that for a moment, the kind of response you might get from those who gather there, especially when you begin to say that the only way to be saved is through Jesus. Um, would you be a little nervous about telling them that? Or what kind of response do you think you would get? And my sense is we might be a little bit nervous because of the the, um, the culture that we live in, you know, it's, it's not real popular to say that the only way to be saved is through Jesus. To say something like that, to, that if you don't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you'll spend the rest of eternity apart from God, can sound really narrow, maybe even a little judgy. Um, it can sound unloving, if it weren't true. If it weren't true, that would be incredibly harsh and narrow and judgmental or critical and unloving to say. But if it really is true, that's one of the most loving things we can say. And to not say anything would be incredibly unloving. Think of it in Acts chapter 4, um, verse 12. It says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Do you get that? There's salvation in no one else. That's what scripture teaches. And so if that's really true, if we really believe that verse to be true, that there's no other name given by which man can be saved, um, then, to, th then it's not harsh to proclaim that. It's actually unloving to, to, you know, to reap the benefits of a personal relationship with God and say nothing to other people just because we're afraid of an awkward conversation or what they might think of us. And I recognize that it may be not, be, not be popular in our culture, um, but you know, the question, you know, kind of the million dollar question today really is, is just what are you willing to risk for the salvation of others? What are you willing to risk for the salvation of others? You know, and, and we may not risk our lives, but um, certainly sometimes, you know, we, we risk an awkward conversation or popularity or a variety of other things when we begin to say, you know, things like what it teaches in Scripture. You know, in Acts chapter 13, verse 13 to 14, we read that, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidia and Antioch. So the journey that Paul and his companions took from Paphos, where, which we read about last week, to Pisidia was a very risky trip. It was an incredibly dangerous trip. You know, it, it was rugged, it was susceptible to bandits, you know, and thieves and all kinds of different things. And so... You know, what prompted them to, to do this? Well, it's, it's because they love the Lord and they love people. You know, and so they were willing to risk everything, leaving behind the comfort of their home to go to a place, you know, just to get there that was going to be dangerous, to tell people something that they may or may not necessarily want to hear, uh, to face incredible persecution. In fact, Paul, just about everywhere he went on his missionary journey, it ended with him being run out of town. They did all that, they risked that because they believe that it is the most loving thing we can do to tell people about Jesus. You know, and to not tell other people is not very loving. So once again, you know, this morning I want you to think about this as we read this passage is what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to risk, um, you know, in order to tell people about Jesus? And, and so the, um, 
Before we go any further in this passage, a couple things to make note of in the passage that we just read. Um, first of all, we, we read, you know, it says Paul and his companions. And so we see a shift, you know, up to this point, he'd been mostly referred to as Saul, but now he, from this point forward, known as Paul. And some of that is Saul is his Hebrew or Jewish name, but as Saul's ministry and mission extend beyond Jerusalem into more and more Gentile territories, then more and more he's referred to as Paul, which is his Roman name. And so it's just a matter of adapting to the, the culture and the setting in which he was going. You know, the other part, thing we notice here as well is that phrase, Paul and his companions. There's a, there's a shift. Up to this point, it's always been Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. And now we either read about Saul, Saul slash Paul, and Barnabas, or we read about Paul and his companions. You know, all of a sudden now Paul is getting first billing. And, um, and so there's this definite shift now in terms of who's leading them on these missionary journeys. And, and Paul had really emerged as the leader uh, of their missions. And, and some of this change actually may be what um, led John, I mentioned in this passage, that John returned to Jerusalem, or he departed for Jerusalem. That, that John is the same one that's referred to as Mark, who wrote the gospel according to Mark. So you can call him John, you can call him Mark, you can call him John Mark, it's all the same person. But so in this, you know, it's inter what's interesting is John and Barnabas were cousins. And, and some speculate that, that just maybe John wasn't on board with this shift of leadership, that he was loyal to Barnabas, but there's something about Paul that, that he just, you know, didn't buy into. And, I, and that happens sometimes. Not everybody's, you know, the, right for everybody. I, I get that. And, um, and so um, Luke in Acts, you know, says it really nicely. He says, he departed to Jerusalem. Paul, later on in, in chapter 15, didn't say it quite so nicely. He said that Barnabas deserted them. There's one point where Barnabas was telling Paul, he said, you know, I'd really like to bring, you know, John Mark back in along this missionary journey with us. You know, what do you think? And, and Paul's response is, I, I don't want him. He deserted us before. He's not welcome anymore. And, and so this led to this sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, so much so that Barnabas left Paul at that moment and, and, and took John Mark and, and went on their mission, missionary journey of their own. And we'll talk about that more in a few weeks. But there's definitely this shift that was taking place. And um, so let's continue a little bit further. Chapter 13, verse 14 to 15. So on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and they sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. So we kind of need to understand a little bit the way their, their churches were set up a little bit differently than ours. They're very, very consistent. The tradition that had been happening for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in the synagogues is the Jewish people would come together. And, and so first they would read a portion of scripture from the, the law. It's called the law here. It's also known as the Torah, which makes up the first five books of the Bible. If you go back Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that's the Torah, filled with a lot of law and commandments and things like that. And so they would read that. And then they would read um, a, a portion of scripture from the prophets. And, um, and many of these prophecies actually contain um, prophecies about a future Messiah that would come and, and bring um, salvation to God's people. And, uh, and so then the other tradition, after they'd read from the law and they'd read from the prophets, is that they would call upon somebody to step forward and kind of share their thoughts or expand a little bit or maybe give a me message or a sermon essentially on the passage that they just read. There are some um, denominations that still kind of have a similar pattern of liturgy even within their services. And, um, and so on this occasion, because Paul was there with, with the others, and Paul had this incredible reputation as, as being well, well schooled within the, within the Jewish teaching. He had a reputation that had been around for quite a while. And so they turned to Paul and his companions and said, would you please just share something with us from, from, from what we just read? Would you just enlighten us? And so Paul never misses an opportunity to kind of preach or teach. And, and so he takes advantage of the opportunity. And, and we, what we have here is um, Paul's first recorded sermon in Scripture. It's not... Um, <clears throat> 
it, it's, it may not be the first time he ever preached or, or shared like that, but it's the first one that we have recorded here in Scripture. You know, I, I remember my first sermon. I was in ninth grade. We went on a, a mission trip down to, um, out to, to Mexicali uh, near Cuernavaca and, and um, preached my first sermon there and then came back in the following Sunday in my home church in Pismo Beach and preached my first sermon there when I was in ninth grade. You know, on a Sunday night, people there and everything. And um, I got to tell you, I don't know that it was great. Uh, people were really gracious. I don't even remember what I preached about, but it was kind of a big deal. And so we have his first sermon here, but it's interesting, it's also the longest recorded sermon we have of Paul. Uh, and, you know, and, and I can guarantee you, my first sermon was not my longest s- sermon. And I, and, and now, the reality is it's not the longest sermon that Paul ever preached, and we know that for a fact. You go a little bit further um, in the book of Acts, and, and one night he's preaching and teaching, you know, it says around midnight, and he's still going because he's got to leave the next day. And, and one, of the, one of the guys there is listening to him and fell asleep while he's preaching. You know, I like to believe that that's never happened while I'm preaching, but I'm not so sure. And, um, but somebody fell asleep and actually fell out of the window and fell down and they died. I mean, you talk about messing up your service, you know. And, and, and so Paul, what does Paul do? So he goes down and basically, by the power of God, brings this man back to life. And then what's he do? He goes back to preaching and teaching and continues until daylight. And so, um, so if you ever think I'm a little long-winded, nothing compared to Paul, you know, and so, uh, which might not work in our short attention span world that we live in. So the passage we're looking at today, I'm kind of warning you a little bit, it's a little bit longer. And I even tried to, you know, find ways to kind of summarize it or something like that, but I just thought, you know what, if it's, it, we're not going to do justice to it if we do that, and, you know, if it's, it's in the Word of God, you know, we gotta, we got to work our way through it and not skip around. And so... Buckle up, try and focus, and listen as Paul kind of uses, he actually uses what they've been teaching and talking about from the law and the Old Testament, and I mean, I shouldn't say the Old Testament, but it was, and, 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 and prophecy readings, and uses all of this to point towards Jesus Christ, and so kind of this big history lesson. Stephen did a similar thing, Peter did a similar thing, it seemed a lot of times when they preach, you get a lot of history in there as well, uh, but it all points to Jesus, so Track it with me, and we'll kind of move along, and I'll keep my points a little more brief on the back end. So standing up, it says that Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. In other words, he put up with them. Isn't that gracious of God? And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel, the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So everything up to this point is pretty much about what God has done, and, and it really is God doing everything over and over. God did this, and God did this, and God did this. Now he shifts his focus on, more specifically on Jesus. So he says, from this man's descendants, referring to David, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you're looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. You see where he's going with this, pointing to Jesus. And then Paul continues, fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that the message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they actually fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence. They asked Pilate to have him executed. When they carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. 
God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So as also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed, but the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, uh, through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care what the prophets have said um, does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and, and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. Well, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. But when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored. Uh, and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region, so they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. There it is. Wow, it's a lot of stuff. So like I said, I'll keep my points relatively brief, and, and, just, and they're all really focused around Jesus. And, and, um, and because that's what this message is, is about, is it really about Jesus. And the first point is, is Jesus is the epicenter. Jesus is the epicenter. Now that word epicenter actually means to be above the center. And I think that's what Jesus is. He's at the center of everything, of all of history. He's the focal point of our faith but he's also above all things as well. And so you got this message from Paul. It, it's kind of a history lesson that begins with Moses' time and works up through David. And, and he's essentially saying, and then John the Baptist, and everything is leading up to Jesus' birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Everything since the fall of, you know, of man in, in the Garden of Eden, everything is pointing you know, in God's plan of redemption towards Jesus Christ. You know, and um, everything's been pointing to this, the day that Jesus would come and bring salvation through his death and resurrection. And, and so ever since, you know, Jesus' death, and then ever since Jesus' death and resurrection, you know, we look back to what Jesus did on the cross for salvation, and we look forward to his second coming. Everything is about Jesus. You know, for that matter, consider even our calendar, the year 2022. Well, that's 2022 A.D., you know, you have B.C., and that's everything before Christ, before his birth. And then you have A.D., which we used to, you know, sometimes used to think of meant after death, but that's not really what it stands for. It's Latin for Anon Domino, which means in the year of the Lord. It refers to the year that Jesus was born. And so every time we write, write anything down, it's like our, our dates, everything, everything points to Jesus as the center of history. Rick Warren said it this way, he said, 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, an event occurred that permanently changed the world. Because of that event, history was split. Every time you write a date, you're using, you're using Jesus Christ as the focal point. Every time you write a date, you're using Jesus Christ as the focal point. Isn't that cool? You know, Jesus is the epicenter of all history. He's the focal point of our faith. You know, a while back, and you may have heard this poem before, but I thought it was so appropriate when we're talking about just the you know, Jesus as the epicenter. We're talking about his, his, his power and his influence on all of humanity for years and years to come, unlike anybody ever has or anybody ever will on this earth. And, and he wrote a poem called One Solitary Life, and it describes Jesus this way. It says, he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. 
He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. When he was only 33, his friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves, and while dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. That one solitary life. Jesus is the epicenter. You know, everything that, 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 that Paul is teaching, it says it's all about Jesus. The second thing that I get out of Paul's message is that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises and prophecies. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises and, and, and his prophecies. And God had made these incredible promises that he would send a Messiah, you know, and, and, and then he gave prophecies, you know, he, there's all these promises and he gave prom, prophecies that would help kind of point them and give clues as to who the Messiah was. You know, Paul repeatedly talks about this in, in his message. In verse 23, he said, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Verse 27 says, the people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they actually fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Did you get that? They didn't, even, they didn't recognize him for who he was, but even the things they did ended up fulfilling the prophecies about Jesus. And then verse 32, 33, it says, what God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. What God has promised, what God has prophesied over and over and over. You know, um, I, I shared a while back about, um, I was going back in, I think, in the 1950s, a long time ago, but even back then, there was a guy by the name of Peter Stoner, uh, who was a mathematician, and he identified at least 300 prophecies, messianic prophecies, um, in the Old Testament, specific prophecies about where the Messiah would be born, how he'd die, all kinds of different things like that. And, and, and so being a mathematician, he, he calculated what are the odds that, that any any man would fulfill even eight of those 300 prophecies. And what he found is that, that the odds of anybody fulfilling even eight of those 300 prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. One to 10 in the 17th power. Now, if you know what that is, put a one and put 17 zeros after it, and that's what we're talking about it. And that's just eight of those. You know, all of God's promises and all of God's prophecies, and, and Paul, Paul is saying, you get together every week and you read about God's promises of Messiah. And, and you, you, you read about the, the prophecies, you know, and, and that, that, that foreshadow, you know, the, the Messiah coming. And I'm telling you, it's been fulfilled. You don't need to look any further. Jesus came and he is the Messiah, the fulfillment of all that God promised. The third thing from this passage, you know, that, that I just read Jesus came, once again, it's all about Jesus, but Jesus, Jesus came as a sacrifice and Savior for our sins. Jesus came as a sacrifice and a Savior for our sins. Yes, he came as God, um, but he also emptied himself and took on the form of man, became obedient even to the point of death on the cross. And listen to what Paul says in verse 38 to 39. He says, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Isn't that great? Through him, through Jesus, everyone who believes, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. The power of sin, the consequences of sin, all of it. You, you see, because God is a just God, he couldn't let, let our sin go unaccounted for. But because he is a loving and a merciful God, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price for our sins on the cross. You know, and if we could be, let me say this, if, good, if being good was good enough, or if we could be saved through any other religion or, or any other avenue, then what Jesus did on the cross was a colossal waste of time. 
You know, if there really is more than one way to be saved than Je through Jesus Christ, then what's the point of what Jesus did on the cross? Let's choose a, an easier avenue. You know, because there's nothing easy about the cross. But that is the only way that we could be saved, the guiltless given up for the guilty. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says it well. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages, what we earn of sin, all sin, not just big ones, all sin, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, and it is a gift. Dylan Burroughs says, said this way, he said, Jesus came to give us life. We don't have to hang on a, on a cross like he did. For him it was a sacrifice, for us it is a gift. For him it was a sacrifice, for us it's a gift. You know, I, I, um, around Christmas time I shared this illustration, but every year at Christmas, you know, my from the time our, 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 our first son was born, you know, we'd go out before Christmas and we'd buy the best, coolest, most awesome presents that we could find them. I especially loved buying presents for them when they were young, you know, because I loved all the toys and everything and I got to play with them. It was kind of fun. But we'd go out and we'd buy all that and we'd wrap it up and we'd put it under the tree. And we paid the price for all those gifts. All they had to do was to receive them and open them and enjoy them. You know, we paid the price. They just need to receive it. You know, and, and it did cost us something. You know, there was a price to be paid, but they reaped the benefit of our sacrifice. And on a much grander scale, Jesus Christ did all the heavy lifting. He paid the price for us, for our sins. And it was costly. It cost him his blood on the cross. But it's a gift to us, one that each of us needs to receive. You know, it's one, one thing to believe in Jesus. It's another thing to place your faith in Jesus, to accept him as your Lord and Savior. And that's what, that's what, that's what Paul's talking about here, is that anyone who, who believes in him, places their faith in him, is set free from every sin. The fourth thing from this passage, Jesus not only died for our sins, he also rose from the dead so that we might do the same. Jesus rose from the dead that we might do the same. He, yes, he came in and he died on the cross, but he also rose again. I always say that, that through the cross we know God's love for us, but through the empty tomb we know about his power. You know, and, um, you know, the, it, it says in, in verse 34, you know, over and over actually, Paul talks about this, but he says, God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. You know, the resurrection is so important. Um, it's mentioned over 300 times in, in the New Testament alone. Over 300 times, we, you find something 300 times in Scripture, it's probably pretty important. You know, Adrian Rogers said, it, said this about the resurrection. He said, the resurrection is not merely important to the historic Christian faith. Without it, there will, would be no Christianity. It is the singular, doct, is a singular doctrine that elevates Christianity above all other world religions. It's a single doctrine that elevates Christianity above all other world religions. No other religion can proclaim anything that comes close to that. You know, the resurrection was, was, it was of utmost importance, and, and Paul's preaching over and over and over, he pointed to the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said, For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. You get that? First importance. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then Paul went on to say in verse 17, he said, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Did you get that? If Christ is not risen, if he didn't come back from the, the grave, if, if there is no empty tomb, then your faith is futile, you're wasting your time, you're still in your sins. You see, Jesus laying down his life on the cross you know, that was an incredibly loving act, an amazing act of love. But if he, never, if he never rose from the grave, that's all it would be was a loving act. You know, we would still be dead in our sins. There would still be no hope for life after this life. You know, it changes everything. There have been a number of people over the course of time that loved people or loved a cause enough that they were willing to sacrifice their lives for that, that person or that cause. You know, but only Jesus Christ, you know, not just through his death, but also through his resurrection, we see his love and his power. Romans chapter five, 8, verse 5 says, For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Isn't that cool? 
because he lives, I can face tomorrow. You know, just like the song says. You know, and I got to tell you, there's nothing I like about death. Nothing whatsoever. You know, there's sadness and sorrow. The process is painful. You know, but I would say this, that because, of Je- because Jesus rose from the grave, you know, we do not grieve as the world does, as those who have no hope. You know, we see it through, through an eternal lens. John MacArthur said this. He said, the truth of the resurrection gives life to every other area of gospel truth. The resurrection is the pivot on which all of Christianity turns, and without which none of the other truths would much matter. Without the resurrection, Christianity would be so much wishful thinking, taking its place alongside all other human philosophy and religious speculation. That's, a, that's quite a statement there. You know, aside from the resurrection, Christianity would be just another batch of self-help tips. You know, Jesus' resurrection serves as confirmation of his deity, but also serves as hope for us as well. Um, that those who place their faith in Jesus, the epicenter of, of all humanity, of all history, the focal point of our faith, you know, that's, that's what brings hope. Jesus said in, in John chapter 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you see out of this, you know, Paul's message, just how awesome, how incredible, how truly remarkable, amazing Jesus is. <coughs> and so my hope this morning is that God gives us a fresh awareness of just how amazing Jesus is. The guilt is given up for the guilty. You know, and, and that if we don't know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we would do that. But I think for more of us who probably have done that, the other, the other thing circles back to the first thing. If we really believe what Paul preached, that salvation comes through Jesus and Jesus alone, and anybody who doesn't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will spend the rest of eternity, no second chances ever. You know, if we really believe that, you know, what are we willing to risk for the sake of other people's salvation? You know, that awareness, that belief, you know, it, it, it causes us to look at things differently. It's not unloving to say that you need to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's the most loving thing we can do to inter- introduce people to Jesus Christ. Um, amen. I wish you were with us this morning because we're, we're doing communion, and uh, it's just a perfect Sunday for this. And I don't know if you have juice and crackers or bread or something like that, but maybe just encourage you to do that on your own. By the way, incidentally, if you're not able to join us, you, you can come by the office anytime. I got little portable things, and I can give them to you. And so in the future, you could join us when we do commune. Uh, but join me in prayer. Lord God, we just come before you right now. If there's anybody listening who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, may they place in f- their faith in you, the one and only Savior of all mankind. And um, so, Lord, may we live with a greater awareness and appreciation of who you are. Um, may we be overwhelmed um, with the truth, Lord God, and help us to proclaim the truth, Lord, and more intentionally. Um, help us to be willing to risk things more often because there's so much at stake. And we don't need to communicate things in a hurtful, harsh, um, or arrogant way, not at all. But we do need to communicate at some point. There's just too much at stake not to open our mouths. So give us a, a, an awareness. Give us a sensitivity where other people are at. Help us listen to your spirit to respond to it, God. And we pray that you would bring people into fellowship with you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Man, what a great, great God we have and what an amazing Savior we have, Jesus. Have a great day. God bless you. Thank you.